Hello, everyone. My name is Harold Trincunas. I'm the deputy director here at the Center for National Security and Cooperation, also one of the honors program instructors this year. And uh, it's a real privilege and very proud to introduce one of our honor students today, Tia Sewell, who is going to talk about her thesis, The War Within, Perceived Legitimacy and Psychological Trauma Among Post-9-11 Veterans. I'm going to keep it very short because we only have 30 minutes. But um, once uh, Tia has finished her presentation, we'll have a period for Q&A. And her advisor, uh, Dr. Dean Winslow, will be uh, asked the first question. But then we'll throw it open to the room and to people online. Go ahead, whenever you're ready. Okay, well, first of all, thank you guys all so much for coming. And thank you, Dr. Winslow, for advising this project. Um, I'm really excited to speak with you all about it today. So to jump into my presentation today, I want to start us off with a bit of context. This is a screenshot from a July 2020 article in the Washington Post that talks about the Cursed Platoon, or a group of soldiers that had served under a commander named Clint Lawrence in Afghanistan. Lawrence had served six years of a 19-year prison sentence for war crimes when President Trump pardoned him in 2019. The article basically describes a platoon that has suffered a range of problems, from PTSD and arrests to depression and suicide since the men returned home in 2013. One of the members of the group, a 27-year-old named James Twist, who's pictured here on the right, died of suicide on October 23rd, 2019, just a, week, a few weeks before Lawrence had officially been pardoned by President Trump. I've included an excerpt on this slide from a blog post that Twist had written on the day that he died, entitled The Invisible War Inside My Head, in which Twist discusses struggling with this question of whether his service actually mattered whether providing the Afghan civilians with a little bit of freedom was enough. So I begin with this story today for two reasons. For one, as I talk about statistics a lot in this presentation, I think it's important to keep in mind that we are talking about individual stories such as that of James Twist. And as we think about the scale and the complexity of the problem of veteran suicide, we must not lose sight of this human aspect. So I hope you all bear this in mind as I go through the presentation. The second reason that I begin with this story in particular today is because it was actually a really important motivator for me in choosing to write about this topic. Specifically, I think this story begs the question as to whether or how political events relating to conflict, like the pardoning of Lawrence, but also more broadly, maybe the nature of a war can impact those who served within it. So today I'll organize my presentation as shown. I will start off with some background, move into my research design, describe my main findings, and then offer some conclusions before opening this up to questions from all of you. With that, we'll move into the background. So veteran suicide is a major problem, so major that President Biden explicitly addressed it during the State of the Union this year, as rates have continued to increase at a pace that exceeds that of the non-veteran population, which is displayed in this chart on the left, looking at age and sex adjusted rates among veterans and non-veterans. The raw rate of suicide among post 9-11 veterans peaked at 45.9 per 100,000 in 2018, which is about two and a half times that of the general public. And just among those who have served in the post 9-11 wars, it's estimated that more than 30,000 veterans have died by suicide, a staggering figure that is four times that of the number of casualties sustained in action during Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. I think this framing is important because it highlights the national security elements of an issue that is too frequently grouped, more so or predominantly into psychiatric, psychological, and public health domains. With that, a lot of researchers have looked at factors that might actually help us understand these high suicide rates among veterans, both in general, but also specifically uh, veterans of the global war on terror. So suicide is an incredibly complex issue with myriad and often compounding risk factors. For veterans, studies have highlighted, among other things, the role played by trauma, um, by cultures of stigmatization in the military institution, by exposure to high stress situations, um, in addition to non-military factors, as well as developments that have grown more relevant in the 21st century, like increasing gender diversity and racial diversity in the military, rapid deployment cycles and factors associated specifically with the nature of counterinsurgency, like increased TBIs from an uptick in the use of improvised explosive devices. For the purpose of this thesis, I focus predominantly on the trauma aspect. Trauma related to war can take many forms, and while it's most commonly understood to translate into post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, my research focuses on moral injury, which expresses similar symptoms and can be related to PTSD, 
but ultimately it comes from a different uh, causal mechanism. So I'll get into that now. The term moral injury was actually coined in Jonathan Shea's 1994 book, Achilles in Vietnam. Shea, who had worked for many years as, psychi as a psychiatrist at the VA, um, noticed that many Vietnam veterans diagnosed with PTSD actually seemed to be struggling with a different form of trauma, though they exhibited the traditional PTSD symptoms of anxiety, depression, anger, isolation, insomnia, and self-medication. So as described on this slide, PTSD is a disorder in which people have experienced a shocking or dangerous event, and they might later struggle with fight or flight reactions in inappropriate situations, feeling stressed or even afraid when they are not in danger. Moral injury, by contrast, is a self-accusation. It's prompted by something that you did, uh, something that you failed to do, or something that you witnessed. Shea described it as stemming from, quote unquote, the betrayal of what's right in a high stakes situation by someone who holds power. And so just to hammer into this overlap a little bit more, they're notably associated with one another in psychology research. And indeed, there are a lot of symptoms that overlap between the two, including suicidality, as shown there at the bottom. But ultimately, they're distinguished, again, in that causal onset. Given the relatively high potential for both PTSD and for moral injury among veterans, um, research specifically looking at these forms of trauma is critical to understanding veteran suicide and post 9 11 suicide, uh, veteran suicide in the US today. So, having sped through a bit of background, I'll discuss my specific research within this space now. The questions that I sought to answer with this project are one, whether veterans' approval of the war that they served in is related to moral injury, and two, whether I can confirm that moral injury is related to suicidality, as literature has independently established. So the hypotheses and theory behind this broader question of how perception of legitimacy might relate in the story of post 9-11 veterans is that one, the post 9-11 wars were viewed as illegitimate by some who served in them. Two, if that is true and the relationship between moral injury and legitimacy is confirmed and moral injury is related to suicidality, then we may arrive at the suggestion that the perception of conflict legitimacy could indirectly exacerbate suicidality among veterans of these wars. So now for my methodology, I conducted an anonymous online survey using Survey Planet. I had 54 respondents who indicated that they had served in Afghanistan or Iraq. And the questionnaire collected demographic and service related data, in addition to information on legitimacy for each war, moral injury and suicidality. I'll discuss the construction of those variables now. I first collected information for each war in order to build a legitimacy score. This was a combination of scores for subcomponents of legitimacy. So for example, it measures, this little section here of the survey, uh, measured the degree of agreement with the statement that the initial decision to use military force in Afghanistan or in Iraq was the right decision. It also asks to what degree respondents believed it was the right decision back in 2001 or in 2003. This section of the survey poses similar questions about expectation setting, troops conduct, mission success, and withdrawal, all of which are components of legitimacy according to the 2019 US Army Field Manual on Stability. And then respondents' scores for a conflict were only used if they served in it. So if somebody served in Afghanistan but not Iraq, their Iraq scores would not factor into the data that I used. I next measured moral injury using this 10 item screener which has been declared in the literature a quote unquote reliable and valid measure of MI symptoms that can be used to screen for MI. This questionnaire com combines self-reported symptoms of betrayal, guilt, shame, moral concerns, loss of trust, loss of meaning, difficulty forgiving, self-condemnation, religious struggle, and loss of religious faith. Finally, I measured suicidality in the survey using items number one and number two from the Suicidal Behaviors Questionnaire revised version, looking at lifetime ideation as well as frequency in the past year, like uh, the moral injury uh, screener that I used. This has also been established to be a reliable and effective way of measuring suicidality. So now I'll move into my findings. First, I find evidence consistent with prior research showing a statistically significant moderate positive correlation between moral injury and suicide risk. Second, I find support for the hypothesis that people who viewed the conflict they served in as less legitimate typically scored higher in the moral injury section. 
With a simple regression, I show that here. You can see that as legitimacy increases on the x-axis, MI decreases on the y. But even beyond a binary regression, we can observe this relationship. Accounting for suicidality, marital status, age, service length, political identity, service branch, education, ethnicity, and religiosity, I find that the overall perception of the legitimacy of a conflict uh, is negatively associated with moral injury with significance. That is right at the top, legit score. For the second part of this hypothesis, I look specifically at one measure of legitimacy that service members would have no control over, the decision to initiate war. Separating by the data by whether a veteran approved or disapproved of the war's initiation, I found that there were significant differences for two symptoms on the moral injury screener, shame and moral concerns. And so those are flagged in the graph. I realize it might be hard to see. To zoom in on that a bit, I show box plots here in which the disapproved group is on the left and the approve or neutral group is on the right. As you can see, people who disapproved of the initiation of the war that they served in had a higher agreement on average with the statement, I am ashamed about what I did or did not do during this time. Below in red, we see that the disapproved group similarly expressed more agreement with the statement, I am troubled by having acted in ways that violated my own morals or values. And I think that this is really interesting because this seems to suggest very directly that there's some correlation between one's view of the war broadly and specifically whether it should have even been started um, and one's personal degree of shame or guilt for participating in it. I also found that perceived legitimacy acts as a negative moderator on the association between MI and suicidality, um, which is to say that the relationship between moral injury and suicide ideation is stronger when people believe that the conflict was more illegitimate. Um, so specifically, my data shows that this relationship accounts for 11% to 13% of the total variance in suicidality. Um, and if that's confusing, it basically, ah, <laughs> basically just means that um, moral injury's predictive power for suicidality changes significantly at different levels of legitimacy. The same way that, for example, gender has been shown to change the strength of the relationship between work experience and salary. And so to show that moderation effect graphically, you can see on this chart with moral injury on the X and suicidality on the Y, that the slope of the regression lines becomes steeper at lower legitimacy levels. So here the red line is signaling any legitimacy scores that were less than 11 um, to the lowest. And you can see that relationship is the strongest. Um, the middle is the orange line. That's kind of a more moderate uh, conception of the war. And then the green is a more legitimate. Um, and so as you can see, like if you come from the same moral injury score, but you have a higher legitimacy score, then you're gonna be less at risk uh, for suicidality based on this model. So with all that, why? Well, in short, the what are we doing here matters to the troops. Every person is different and it can be hard to generalize about a causal chain that might look very different among different veterans but I nonetheless try to tease some of that out in my thesis. While a lot of research focuses specifically on moral injury as a product of direct exposure to an acute moral harm, such as killing someone or seeing civilian deaths, I think it's broader than that. If shared expectations and values in the military form a moral world that effectively gives people the license to fight or to aid a violent mission, what happens when somebody who has been on multiple deployments stops believing that those values are actually being met? or that they're achievable at all, starts thinking that their efforts are futile, that the things that policymakers say about good and evil might not actually be true. I think that a sense of institutional betrayal, political deception, and political failure can all exacerbate moral injury. And there's a great book that I'd recommend to all of you um, that really gets to the heart of this idea with documentation of different veterans' stories. It's called What Have We Done by David Wood, and it's in the corner over there. Pulling on just one quote from that book, I think it comes down at least partially to this. The wars that followed in the wake of 9-11 were shrouded in morality, from their mandate to their mission, to their standards and rules for those on the ground. But as put by Stephen Canty here, things are more complicated 
The U.S.'s all-volunteer service fought under the banner of democracy promotion and of state building in the wake of the national tragedy that was 9-11. Many people enlisted in response to that. But as the war grinded on, these aspirations failed on both tactical and strategic levels. So bringing us back to the example of Clint Lawrence, these words on the slide are those of Lucas Gray, who was a former specialist in his unit. There are three interesting things about this quote that I want to point out. The first is that political events can radically reshape conceptions of the morality in the US military. The second is that one's conception of the US military can be related to one's own individual sense of purpose. The third is that Gray initially conceived of the army as something that was quote unquote perfect and honorable, and perhaps that altruistic shell is necessary to protect people from the very real moral questions of what it means to fight in a war. But when that shell of a greater good dissolves, those questions are left not to the institution, but to the people who originally believed in it. And while US troops have been withdrawn from Iraq and Afghanistan, internal battles rage on for many who served in the global war on terror. On the day that the Taliban took Kabul, the US Veterans Crisis Hotline received its most calls ever in a single day. 2,570. And in the weeks around that time, it received 35,000 calls. So how do we explain that? I think that political events, like the withdrawal from Afghanistan or the pardoning of Clint Lawrence, can alter veterans' perception of the war that they served in. These events, like the decisions that are made in war themselves, shape the moral world that one's service exists within. So now for our last few minutes, I'll move into my conclusion. Part of the reason that I think these findings are so interesting is because they address a lot of the gray zone of the overlap between the military and politics. While there is a lot of inherent separation between these two, in theory, for good reason, we also can't assume that Huntington's conception of the soldier in the state really holds true in reality. As put by one Dutch researcher, being an instrument of the state means that one's profession is intimately linked to political practices rather than disconnected from them. And in Clausewitz and On War talks about war being a continuation of policy. Most of us who study IR know that. He also explicitly ex addresses the role of moral forces in war, stating that these forces are quote unquote, among the most important subjects. These moral forces create the moral world that troops operate within, and sometimes they permeate individual conceptions of self-worth. So a few thoughts to end on. In the US's forever wars, there was a large dissonance between political decisions and experiences on the ground. Some service members, particularly those who quote unquote bought in to the rhetoric about the US mission post 9-11, struggled to separate kind of their personal identity from the overall purpose of the mission that they participated in. And setting realistic, consistent, and achievable expectations in war, a component of legitimacy, can impact veterans' mental health later on. That's something that I think is important for policymakers to be thinking about in the future, particularly when we consider the costs of war. Finally, I find that political events related to a past conflict can trigger adverse responses among veterans who served within it, which kind of points out the need to provide adequate support when we, uh, when we think that something might be triggering. But most importantly, I wanna end on this idea that soldiers represent their society. And for that, we are responsible for their wounds because it is we collectively who have commanded them to be put in harm's way. Finally, some questions that I think you might wanna think about. Um, number one is just how should policymakers think about the mental health costs of engaging in conflict before and during and after a war? How should we potentially temper expectation setting or make less radical commitments? Two, how might the military better proactively equip its members to protect themselves from moral injury related to war legitimacy? If moral questions are inherently a part of war, are we doing a good job of preparing people for them? And three, something that I think is interesting is the nature of the all volunteer force in and of itself being potentially different than the nature of the conscripted force. So conscientious objection only allows 
de facto on principles that are religious or moral. You have to prove that you have some ideological um, conviction against war in general. You cannot make a political ar argument to um, de facto from a war. And I think that with this data, it's an interesting question as to whether or not we can hold seven, 18 year olds um, accountable to their decision to join the military, potentially coming from circumstances where they didn't necessarily know what that would entail to participate in a conflict that they might not agree with, um, which we saw in some cases with Iraq. So with that, I'll open it up for questions from you all. Thank you. Just uh, for our audience online, if you'd like to ask a question, just enter it in the Q&A function of Zoom. But go ahead, Professor Wiesel. Thank, thank, thanks so much, Harold. But Tia, that's just absolutely a magnificent presentation. And you know, your work is you know, it's just absolutely flawless in terms of what you were able to do. Um, those you didn't, she didn't have time to actually you know, go through much of the background information, but she did present her data, which of course is a huge amount of work. Uh, in this study, but uh, again, the, the full text of the paper is just magnificent. I had one question, and maybe your sample size was too small uh, to determine this, but did you notice any uh, differences in terms of moral injury uh, between different services? Um, yeah, so my regression models didn't show any statistically significant differences for uh, the service branch. They did show differences for service length, um, with respect to moral injury specifically. Um, I was a little bit surprised by that finding because I think inherently I had hypothesized that maybe um, based on reporting, like Army would have some form of correlation with moral injury that wouldn't be observed in other branches or the Marines as well. Um, but that actually wasn't true, which I think gets to this broader question of maybe it's not even an exposure to combat, but maybe it's just dedicating your life to participating in the advancement of a mission. Um, whatever form that may take on can be traumatic. You know, again, quick comment that makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, again, just as someone who gave a talk about a week ago, I cried during your presentation. And, uh, you know, and again, uh, I never had to point a gun in anger at anyone. I was shot at a few times. But I think just uh, seeing how things unfolded, I think it just was a huge blow for yeah. all of us who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, uh, do we have questions in the room? Yes. Uh, hey, Miriam, then Ethan, and then I missed if anybody over here raised their hand, so raise it again. Oh, Rod, okay. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, thank you, Tia, for the uh, wonderful presentation. Um, a, a question that arose for me is uh, there's this question about incompetence in selling or like with, with policy making and, and selling. Uh, unrealistic expectations or, um, you know, framing wars in, un, uh, in unsavory ways. Um, and there's also uh, this tension, uh, particular, particularly with uh, the, the wars uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan when you're talking about counterinsurgency and, and kind of the nature uh, of the conflict uh, distinct from uh, interstate conflict. So I guess I'm curious to speculate for if, if uh, there's data that, that kind of goes one way or the other how do you see the relationship between those two? Is one more, do you think one is more prominent than the other, or do you think that, I mean, they, they exist together, but I, I guess if you could talk about that more. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna clutch on to one of my, is my, did we lose my slides? Um, okay, start sharing. All right, yeah, so I think a good way to answer this is I had included this in case it came up, the reason that I focus so explicitly on expectations is because it was across the board the lowest score of legitimacy. Um, and so I think when I consider this work, it really is trying to take a lesson away from the past two decades. And I think it makes sense to me when you're reading all of these quotes about people being frustrated with kind of these like unrealistic, like otherworldly expectations, like we shouldn't be asking the military to go state build, um, that's, not, that's not their job. Um, I think that that was a lot more of the frustration that came across. And I think that is inherently tied to kind of the goals of counterinsurgency and to the theory behind it. 
Um, but I think that this, in theory, this thesis adds like a little bit of nuance and a little bit of lesson to what that can entail in its aftermath. Does that make sense? I don't know if this works. I feel like I'll just be on this. Um, it's for the online folks. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, first of all, um, incredible job. It's been really inspiring to see your journey through this thesis project. My question is quite similar to your second concluding question for us, but we have things like the VA to support veterans when they come back. What is a future that you envision where it's like pre-deployment um, mental health support for veterans or for people who are going to be deployed, not yet veterans, right? And kind of how do you see like the government supporting and creating that? institution yeah that's <laughs> i feel that's worthy of its own thesis um i would say i think it's a really interesting question as to like how we prepare people for the psychological pressure that is inherent to war not just in those like ptsd invoking like life or death situations but also in how do you conceptualize like what you're fighting for and how do we kind of like have the values that the american military should have while also kind of insulating service members from conflating like their own personal morality with that of what the US is doing. And I think that that's a really difficult distinction to make because inherently, as Clausewitz said, the moral forces are among the most important in war. Um, and so you lose something there. But I also think it's important to protect people from taking on that burden themselves because right now the people take on the burden and the institution doesn't. Great. I'm going to sneak in one online question and then go to Rod Ewing. Um, so David Korn asks, not sure if your sample size was big enough for this, but did you see any difference in moral injury prevalence between those who had served soon after 9-11 and those who served years later? Hmm. Yeah, so I didn't I didn't take temporal, um, like, is the question about joining post 9-11? About serving. Serving close to 9/11 in the immediate or aftermath. Years, years later. I don't have that data. Um, I think it comes up in the interviews and in a lot of the autobiographies on these conflicts. Like, there was definitely a wane in the perception of the legitimacy of these wars over time, um, and over the course of years, kind of you know waking up in 2010, all of a sudden you might have a question of what you're doing there. And maybe that happens in 2009 for other people. But I think that there was definitely a change in morale over the years based on based on what I've read. Okay, let me go to Rod and we'll see if we can sneak your question in, Chase. All right, uh, Tia, thank you for an excellent presentation on a very important and, and complicated uh, topic. Um, I'm thinking about your concluding remarks where you suggest that uh, there should be ways to equip members to avoid or lessen moral injury. And so I'd be interested in what you imagine that might be. And as a suggestion, I'd ask whether having better or more specific rules of engagement uh, would be perhaps one of the tools for reducing the possibility of moral injury. That's an interesting question. Um, I'm going to address specifically the rules of engagement component. Um, I think that part of the story that fascinated me a lot in the course of writing this thesis is the fact that guidance coming from above on protection of civilians, on kind of like shifting the risk um, from the civilians to the soldiers was not received well all the time. And, I, and so I don't think that that's the solution. I think that actually, contrarily, like you can risk having some form of um, disillusionment when you demand that recruits memorialize, sorry, demand that recruits memorize high moral standards and rules. Um, and so I, I don't know that that's the answer. Um, but I think maybe it's about the way that those rules are presented. Maybe it's about the education that we give people who enlist. Um, I think it's more of a broad, complicated question than putting it into a manual and having it enforced in the chain of command. Okay. Chase, oh, Scott, two, two finger. I was thinking that 
felt that, that um, units that are led by that point that get fewer war crimes than units led by ROTC or commissions that are used up. Is there is there any reason that says the moral Yeah, it's a good question as well. Um, the moral injury is not necessary. There's not a lot of data on it, which is why I did the survey. But um, I think I'll take us back to this article on Clint Lawrence that I started off with, which talks about what having a commander who doesn't take these issues sensitively and compassionately can entail for the people who served beneath him. I think it comes up again and again as well in the interviews, the value of having leaders that you respect. Um, it, it's really critical. And I think maybe some of that could definitely be tied to a good education. And so it's absolutely 100% relevant to have leaders that understand this mission and leaders that understand the nuance of the morality of war um, and also the reasons that we enact principles for the production of civilians. But I think that looking at Iraq and Afghanistan, that, that was not the case too often. Chase, very short question. Very short. Um, um, is there anything from your thesis that helps us better understand the simultaneous challenge of active duty member suicide and if the framework of legitimacy and moral injury, which may look different for active duty, is still at all relevant? Yeah, so I, I think the reason that I chose to focus specifically on post 9-11 veterans and on these factors is because active duty suicide is really, really complicated. Um, as we know from Hacking for Defense, 130 interviews on it. Um, I think that inherently they're related at foundation on this sense of purpose. I think people really struggle with resonating with, the, like reconciling their own sense of purpose with the institution that they're within. And I think that that's a product largely of kind of like the US military's integration of values and like kind of the power of being in this um, really formidable force. But at the same time, I think based on our interviews, there's similarly a problem with purpose and disenfranchisement with those values, even when you're not necessarily talking about a specific war. Great, well, thank you. Please join me in thanking. <laughs>